Welcome back to Caffeine Confessionals. My name is Anna Geary, and today we are here to talk about the Challenge 40 Battle of the Eras, Episode 3. We're joined by my lovely co-host. We have the Southern Luke Muncie. What's up, guys? The Vermontian Zoe Tromboli. Hi, everyone. It is not the night of eliminations. We don't have eight people going home in one week, but we're back to the traditional daily challenge elimination episode we're in the regular season we're in we're in full gear now how y'all feeling great so loved it i was so excited to have like a normal episode no cliffhangers double elimination even like one male one female it was that is this episode had everything to me so i was just all in yeah, and it's, you know, we also got to see them compete, as we'll talk about later, in teams, which is like, oh, hey, if you like the old school version of the challenge, you got four teams competing, and it's like big team aspect. So if you like that style competition, we got that. But then also you got the elimination from the politics. You got new school and old school all coming together. It's, it, it, it gave you everything. It's really good. And Zoe's right. I think the, the cherry on top is the double elimination. Like, if we could have every season have that – It'd be great. I know it makes the season go by faster, but okay. It's the right pace, though. It's like yeah. exactly the right pace, especially because now there are longer episodes than what we had in the past. So it's not like you get shorted on the drama or the relationships or whatever. You still get everything. You just don't like lose stamina as the season goes on, really, because I know that that happens for me. Yeah, and you'd always rather want more than for it to drag. Um, I mean, our our call right now is called Ride or Die because we've been podcasting about this season since then and before then. And those seasons really dragged on for us. And that's when we kind of like lost our interest or like we didn't have as much liveliness for this podcast because these episodes were dragging. Last season, we went through a whole month stretch where nobody got eliminated. Um, so it's good to have those double eliminations to like keep you on your toes, to keep the stakes going. Yeah, it kind of reminds me, I'm going to make a weird connection. I took a training once that was basically like running fun activities for kids because I've worked at after school program summer camps. And the best piece of advice I ever got around that was like, cut it off, like whatever games you're playing with kids when they're having the most fun, like cut it off right then because then you can go back to it and play it again. And that's TV feels like the same thing. Like you need to cut it off when people are still loving it because then it builds up that anticipation. That makes so much sense. It it does. <laughs> I'm like, why can't we play kickball every day? Because <laughs> you wouldn't love it as much. Yeah, I love that. I love that connection to it because I think they could really learn from that. The sweet spot's like 14 episodes. Maybe, I think 14. Yeah, for sure. With I, I, one part reunion. Yes, one oh. part. We don't need two parts to see somebody sing Alien or like, yeah. So let's jump into the uh oh let's no, jump into the production <laughs> we're gonna jump into the episode uh people come back from the eliminations uh some people are excited like theo some people are sad like Kara because Polly's not there um we also had a bunch of showman stuff which we're gonna get into later um was there anything else to note about like notable from the people returning into the house Not really. I mean, they had like all the lo- or the winners of the first elimination thing. We should make an alliance that we all knew wasn't going to happen. But I mean, that was about it. We see Horacio a little isolated, a little down, um, a little checked out. That's the only thing of note I remember from that section. And you had Michelle comforting him, and he really does not like Michelle. Uh, he'll he'll never say that in like a straight on way because that's the type of guy he is. But Horacio just does not like Michelle. Um, yeah, I mean, if you can read body language, that's so clear. Because I think Horacio is like one of the warmest, most welcoming people when he wants to be talking to them. It's clear on his face in his body language. And his body language with Michelle was the exact opposite. It was like, get the hell away from me. Yeah. <laughs> it's uh, someone online was like, why? I think they asked, why does Amanda hate Tori? And my thought was like, there's nothing Tori specifically done. It's just everything she stands for. Um, and I think Amanda hates, like, well, she's done stuff, Luke, I know, I know, over time. But I do think, like, the beginning of it is she just did not like, <laughs> yeah, keep winking. Uh, 
twitching actually. Yeah. Uh, and I think like Horacio is kind of the same way where like nothing, Mich- like I think the way Michelle plays the game is just so opposite of the way he likes to play the game and just it's about pure competition and stuff like that. Where like, so that's why he like, he does not like her, but I don't think it comes from a place of malice. That's why he'll never say it. Yeah. And I want to point out too, I think that Amanda doesn't like Tori because they dated the same guy. Yeah. Yeah. That comes, that comes, but I think she's always kind of like, even on Final Reckoning when they didn't hate each other, I've always thought like Amanda just didn't really care for who Tori was because they I mean they are the they are the opposite humans whatsoever. I'm I'm talking about the guy that Amanda was with on Are the One. Oh, like, Ari and Mike. Yes, he ended up dating Tori too. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Anyways, I forgot about that. Um, <laughs> moving into the daily challenge, the natural t- transition. Um, Players had to step up to be team captain representatives for their team. We're going to get to the daily challenge in a minute. They didn't really know what they were doing at first, but uh, people had to step up. And it was interesting to see who on their teams was willing to. Uh, on era one, you had Darrell and Jody. On era two, you had Aviv and Derek. Era three was Tony and Avery. And era four was Casey and Kylan. Casey and Kylan. And the way I viewed it was these are all the people who kind of skirted out of the first elimination. And because they weren't like for specifically, like when you had like Jody who went in instead of Anissa, she's like, okay, I'll take this on. Darrell who went instead of Derek, like, okay, because I did not go in that elimination, but I was on the chopping block, I'll step up this time because they're not at the top of the totem pole. So being captain, there's like a risk reward to it for them. Yeah, this is just gonna be my first snippet of like dragging Anissa in this episode but if I'm era one I'm never letting her out of that captain spot ever because she is just your biggest anchor and you need to release her as fast as you can that was what I I was like that is where these guys have become way less cutthroat or they never really were that cutthroat because if they really wanted to win they would just have strong armed her into that position. Yeah. And Jody is also someone who is nice enough to be like, yeah, I will lead the team. I will, you know, I will do this as well. Um, to me, it just was like Derek taking turns with uh, Darrell and Derek basically taking turns there of like, okay, you went in last week, you went this week. The only person who really stood out among all of this was Tony who won the elimination last week, he was the only person who repeated as like, okay, I'll take on this leadership position to potentially put myself in danger. Uh, When I first saw this, my opinion was that like, okay, you are at the bottom of the totem pole of this alliance, might as well take on the team captainship so you can maybe be safe. Yeah, it came across like he thought he had something to prove still. Um, That's that's the narrative he was pushing. And I think, yeah, I mean, it's a risky move for anyone that's willing to step into it, especially when they don't really tell you what's going on beforehand. Like, you know that you're putting yourself in danger, but the unknown is the scariest thing on the challenge. For sure. Um, We get into the daily challenge and we we find out what it is. And it's a giant team riverboat race where they're riding these giant dragon boats. Uh, after that, they then have to go through a buffet of incredibly gross foods. Um, we'll talk about some of the foods in a minute, but it it seemed like there was a rule in the daily challenge where only one person could eat a plate at a time rather than them all eating in a row. That would confuse me a little bit, but that's what it seemed to be. And then at the end, there was a memorization portion where they had to not memorization portion. They do literally organize the 40 challenge seasons in right. order. And the first team to get it done uh, was safe. And if you come in last place, your team is going directly into elimination. Did you guys get the vibe that like production wanted to make sure they could torture as many of them as possible before they were eliminated? Like they're like, this is for years of you people being drunk idiots that we've had to manage. So let's make sure we make this first challenge as awful and embarrassing as possible. Yes. And I loved it. I like I love that it had three different elements just packed together. Yeah. We've had so many daily challenges where it's just like just do the riverboat, just do the eating, just do the memorization portion. 
the fact that it was all three and all 32 people basically had to participate was, I think, like, as you're saying, torture and savage and also really cool and really intense. And it's like, if this is how all the daily challenges are going to be, like, whoever wins this season is going to come off looking so impressive because these are not easy challenges whatsoever. Well, and it's one of our main critiques sometimes when they do team challenges is that half the team doesn't really participate. They're just present. So the fact that you couldn't just skate by on your team's performance, I thought was really important. I like when they have to step into the spotlight and actually do something. It also reminded me that as much as sometimes I think I want to be on this show, when you have those nasty rats on a plate in front of you, I don't know if I'm cut out for it. I'm not. I'm thinking that I'm vegan. Sorry. <laughs> and then they give you the stinky tofu and they give you the dirty smoothie. I would have done it opposed to eating a rat. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Like, I, tofu versus things that sell bones in them. Let's talk about the food right now, actually. Let's just because we're it's on our mind. I have a lot of Vietnamese friends. Uh, I come from like a heavily Vietnamese area. Some of those foods, like I've been offered balut a lot of times in my life. I've been offered durian or durian smoothies before in my life. So there was stuff on there like I've actually like encountered going to restaurants and marketplaces and stuff like that. But when you get into the rats and the worms that are literally moving, I just start wanting to vomit. Yeah, the two, those two that you mentioned are the two that I've heard of before. The other ones, I was like, this feels like a stretch. The, whatever Josh had to eat, the, the worms. I'm sorry. No. Between that and the rat, I think the rat was my worst. Cause like you can just see its whole thing. Right. The, ugh. That was, I couldn't wrap my mind around that. I would have been diving for something else on the table. If I saw those things there. Mm. There was one of these seasons where I asked a friend who was from the native country. He's like, do people actually eat that stuff? He's like, no, dude, of course not. And then he's like, well, actually, I know one guy, but he's kind of weird. But it's like, that's. <laughs> Horrible tangent. It, But I'm so sorry. I'm at least glad they're eating nasty stuff because I got thrown back to ride or dies final when they had to eat spaghetti. Yeah, I th- I think there's an in between, you know, right? Like I could well, whatever. I'm fine with them making them eat all that nasty stuff. I think it's a TV show and that's what you signed up for and it's not like it hasn't been done before, so whatever. Um yeah. And, and honestly, I was grateful we didn't have that many puke shots, too. Yeah, we did get a big one of Corey, who has become kind of like the king of puking on these shows. Like, that's all he does in these eating challenges. He just pukes up a ton. I think he's very theatrical about it, because it always looks like it's just like straight liquid. And he's probably just taking a big sip of water and then just spitting it all out. That's yeah. like his game plan. Yeah. I mean, I think Josh, when he said check, literally spit out his last worm. <laughs> <laughs> Talking about water and liquid, though, let's talk about the Dragon Boat race. Um one team in this very much shined, and there was the team that ended up shining throughout the whole challenge, and that was Era 3, where Devin and Jordan just completely took on leadership roles for their team. And Devin has really hit another level in terms of communication in these like team challenges. We saw it in Spies, Lies, and Allies, where his team kind of dominated daily challenges because he would just come up with a strategy for their team. Like his mind has really become like one of the biggest tools on this show. Um Previously, he was just a big tool on this show, might still be, but like he's just figured out these daily challenges to another level and like he might lead this team to like a lot of success. I actually agree wholeheartedly. I think he proved himself to be a huge asset, especially as far as team challenges go. I they were just so much more organized than all the other teams because Era 2 has too many chiefs, you know, like way too much personality conflict going on over there. Um, Era 4, it seemed like there ever, there was no one really taking charge. And Era 1 was just a hot mess. Yeah. I think at a certain point, Michelle took control of Era 4. And I think that's actually what she was really good at. And I think it kind of becomes underrated. Like an underrated skill is just being able to communicate. And she's really good at that. We saw that in some challenges from her last season on 
whatever last season was called, Battle for a New Champion. Um, so she was good at that. Era 2 ended up doing well because they're just all athletic. But again, like, they had too much personalities. Yeah, Era 3 with Jordan and Devin, like, they were working well. And then you have people like Avery, Tori, and Corey, who I think are just good listeners. Yep. Um, so they, like, they can they can put away their ego and just row a boat really well. And that's a massive skill on a team. It's why Devin and Tori won 38, because, like, they just were able to communicate and work together, like, use the muscle, use the brain, come together. Like, Era 3 as a whole just dominate this daily challenge. Yeah. And then one team was just completely awful, which was Era 1. Um, Brad doesn't know how to use the rudder of a boat. Nobody was really no nobody even knew how to lead the team. CT is going crazy on one end. Jody lost her oar. Um, I'm not sure if Anissa did anything, but I'm willing to put blame on her. Just fun. I'm sure she wasn't helpful. <laughs> yeah. I will say CT screening wasn't helpful either. I know that he's like America's darling, but like it was a lot. But also, like, if you're Brad, maybe don't volunteer to be the rudder if you actually don't know how it works. Uh, a, like, Yeah, he's just not the brightest bulb in the box. So it's okay to not know how to do those things. Yeah. And didn't I mean, Jody at one point get out of the boat to switch spots? She was, she, was, she was like, hey, let me take the rudder at one point. He didn't let her take it. And I think, like... Jody would probably be the right person to put in that because she has a lot of like outdoor hit. Like if you rewatch the dual one, anything that had to do with like kayaking or swimming, like Jody is an outdoors person. So she probably does have experience doing that. She just didn't speak up and let Brad, let Brad take it because I think all the other teams had a guy leading them. Um, so I guess that's a mishap on her captainship. Um, yeah. Also on him. Cause she was willing to do it and he didn't let her. And I think he made a comment to CT about you come back here and do it. And I think if CT was going to yell that much, he absolutely should have, yeah. um, but someone should have taken over. He like, and maybe it was editing. Maybe he just ran them into the side three times and then got the, got the hang of it. It's totally possible based on how this season's been edited. I think it's very possible that that's how it went. Um, that's I, it had, I hesitate to even say too much about these daily challenges like before we hear from cast members how they actually went down because I feel like we keep getting information that things are really different than how they're portrayed on TV. Um, but yeah, someone else should have taken over, period. You look at that team though and like if CT isn't taking over, it's not going to be Darrell. Darrell is not the guy to lead a group. Derek, uh, his communication skills are not the best so it's not gonna be Derek um Tina I like Tina but she's not leading people during a daily challenge so really it comes down to it's not coming down to Jody it's not coming down to Anissa it's not coming down to Brad because I've seen him panic under pressure so it's either Rachel or CT so if those two don't step up you're fucked yeah and they were <laughs> It's sad to say because like all these people are individually legends, but it's like weird because they they were the ones who were competing on these team challenges, and yet I I don't think they work well as a team. I uh, yeah, I don't. I think actually Mark would have done a lot for team chemistry. Um, I think he's kind of a bridge between some of these guys because otherwise, especially once they get going in a physical capacity, these guys don't speak the same language. I just think that they're very different competitors when you watch them perform now like hanging out and just socializing I think they get along great but um yeah Darrell and Derek are both really quiet and Brad and CT are kind of erratic personalities so and we've all seen CT how he reacts when like a partner isn't performing to his standards so not he doesn't handle those situations always gracefully hopefully he's learned from that but he didn't in this episode yeah there's also a difference between ct yelling at like a 25 year old yeah. um versus like because they're gonna listen to him because he's ct and he's terrifying them but it's like ct yelling with his contemporaries like you know it's like a whole different scenario of like them being like shut the fuck up i knew you 20 years ago um I, it's not the same situ situation so uh, 
Mark would have done real a lot for this team because they do have a reverence towards him because he is the godfather to them. Like it's a it's a it's a corny nickname, but they all do respect him and love him a lot. Right. And I think he just has the best soft skills out of the group. So as we basically have said, era one era three wins the daily challenge. Era one comes in last place. This means that Darrell and Jody are going into the first elimination of the season. Um, I saw people last week being like, man, I can't believe we lost all these big names last week. How is the show going to move on? Well, we're into the next weekend. We have a four-time champion and a two-time champion, probably top 10 in each their gender all time, in the next elimination. Like, that's how stacked our cast is. Yes, we're going to miss the people we lost last week, but we are just, we've been blessed with this cast this season. Yeah. Before we move on for the, from the Daily Challenge, I do want to give Tori a shout out because she also was the reason they motored through all those challenge seasons because she like the total dork she is sat there in the room with all the lists and memorized them and wrote them down in her journal and studied them um which i can't believe more people didn't do that (laughs) but maybe they did (laughs) but i that's a big reason why they won so whereas devin and jordan carried them for the first half it was all tori on that last part which kudos to her that's a great thing to know especially because uh they did that on dirty 30 they did the same thing put the 30 seasons in order and tori was on that season so she had the like that's actually the crazy of like hey i remember doing this on season 30 but we're probably going to do it on 40 so yeah that's where experience comes into play agree we move out of the daily challenge so we know that tony and avery are in power um uh, Darrell and Jody are on the are going directly into elimination, and TJ comes announces the twist that the nominees will be the only two people who can get voted into elimination. So that means it's either going to be Kylan and Casey or Derek and Aviv. And the interesting wrinkle is that you couldn't vote them in individually; you got to vote them in as a pair into that elimination. And at that point, they're thinking they're competing as pairs, also. Right. Yeah. Knowing what we know that they don't go in, like they don't compete together, I'm curious if next week he'll say, okay, you can pick one from each. That's what I think I, that would be fun. Honestly, that's what I was wondering the whole time. That If I was Tony and Avery, I would have been asking that question. Yeah. Maybe yeah. they did. The thing with this, though, and I, I like this this twist, but like – the incentive to be the winner is not that high anymore. <laughs> like, I don't want to be captain. Well, well, I guess we get yeah. the uncle later. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. You're right. You're right. You're right. Sorry. No. Yeah. Um. Completely right, Luke. Uh, coming out of the daily challenge and like with that on the line, uh, Era Four makes a move towards Tony, uh, because they know Avery wants to save her her good longtime friend Derek. Um, they make a move towards Tony, and they're like, hey. Uh, your team would do in a bunch. How about we look out for you as era four if you look out for us this time and throw in Derek and Aviv? Uh, Tony sounds into that idea. Um, what were your thoughts on like era four making the movement towards him? I think it was the the right move on their part. Tony is more of a lone wolf. He is also more easily manipulated because he is not the brightest bulb in the box either. Um, and I do think that there is something logical about era three and four working together because era one and two are just naturally going to be drawn to each other because of those relationships. So I think it is a smart play from their team. Um, that's who they have the best chance at moving forward with. And I do think they're really strong team too. could potentially trade off wins back and forth. Yeah. And I mean, even Dev and Tori said in the room with Tony, like that probably is the best bet. Like, Tori even says, we can't let this be a friendship game, which is super ironic kind of her. She's like, I've got so many friends in this game that I'm not going to stick my neck out. I've got to look out for my team. I'm like, we'll see. But uh, it does make sense in terms of working together. However, from just like a pure, like, I want to win this game standpoint, I felt like Avery might have had a point too. Oh, not yeah. just saving Derek, but like, Kyle and Casey are really good. Like this could be a chance to get them out of here. And Darrell and Jody are too. Like that yeah. makes sense to me too. 
I think it made sense for Eric War to go for Tony because he's Completely. the weak. Completely. And uh, yeah. some credit on the other side is that Naya was really pushing Avery to save Derek and Aviv. She's like, that's your friend. Save your best friend. But also, let's make the move against these really big targets. Like, let's not play this game safe because you and I, girl, we're not. We're the people at the bottom of the barrel in terms of, like, who gets viewed in this cast because there's a lot of big players. Make the big move now. And I did appreciate Naya like giving her permission. Like that's what people do in this game all the time. They save their friends. Don't feel like you can't because you haven't been here. Like you have just as much as a right as anyone else to try and save your friend. Yeah, I agree. And I didn't want to also know on Luke's point of like the Tori and Devin being like, this can't be the friendship type game. That's what they say when they're trying to save their friends on era four. And that right. to me was just like so transparent of like, Oh, yeah, you want to save Casey because you guys have played a million games with Casey. You guys are like in lockstep and like no matter what, but you're going to say that. Um, we get to the deliberations, and Casey, I think, presents herself really well. I think this whole time that she presents herself well. I think Kylan spoke a little bit too much in terms of like what he was trying to appeal with to Tony. Um, Derek, 50 50 on his words. And Aviv, who's getting a lot of confessionals in these episodes, Tons. didn't did not say anything in this conf did not say anything in this deliberation, which either they edited her out or like she just said nothing. She literally said nothing. She didn't even have a reaction when she got thrown directly under the bus by Darrell of all people, which was, I mean, not jaw dropping because kudos to him. He wants to win. I, I think it was if I'm them, I want to face. If I'm Darrell and Jody, I want to face. Derek and Aviv also just based on experience and physical capabilities um but it was still it was bold to say it right to her face at that table and she just like had a delayed smile I'm like ah uh, and I guess when you asked earlier Alan like anything notable in that first blocking scene yeah. it was probably that Darrell and Aviv had this conversation that had been so nicely put in there for foreshadowing we got to figure out how to win this together. <laughs> and then it's Darrell being like, ah, love you, but I want to stay. I did just realize too, that Darrell lost to Kyland last season on battle for a new champion and Casey lost to Jody on world championships, which I don't think many people realize. Cause it's just like, we don't like to think of world championships that much, but that did happen. Uh, <laughs> so they're both understandably scared of them. Yeah. She might have lost to Kiki, actually. I don't I know. Don't think she lost to Jody. She, I think she lost to Darrell and Kiki. Then I guess. Yeah, that makes that. I think that sounds right. Because at a certain point, Casey went into every elimination on that season. Um, that might have happened. Who knows? I, I think she. Out. I think she outlasted Jody. I do too. She was partnered with Ben. Well, no. Then she was partnered with Troy after, and then they went to like all those eliminations. Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 Because yeah. 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 Blacked it out. Anyways, I don't blame Darrell and Jody for wanting to face those two. Yeah. Friendship or not, like. You had Derek, though, pushing Tony. It's like, well, you want to make the big move. And then Tony takes offense of like, does that mean you're going to make a big move after me next? And I I was just like, in my heart, I was like, oh, Tony doesn't realize you're not a big move on, uh, in this cast. And I don't think Tony's a bad player, but on this cast, you're just not a big move. Yeah. No, not even a little bit. infuriating at the end that tony says i'm going to go in but so happy that avery was like okay me too <laughs> like he really thought he was going to strong arm her i honestly think they're both dumb for that i i i respect it on avery's part but i also think it's stupid i think yeah. at some point you have to put your own game first and it's in the same way that I think Ashley and Hunter were selfish when Amanda did that for them on Final Reckoning. Like, your real friends shouldn't let you do that for them. True, but I guess, and, and this is not just in defense of Ashley, like, but it is also. In the same sense that you shouldn't stalemate yourself, if someone's going to stalemate for me, I'm not going to step in if the end goal is the money. You know what I mean? So I think it just like is a very sticky situation where obviously the dumbest people are Tony and Avery. I just wanted to wring his neck though. Yeah. It, it, 
his was came coming from a place of total toxicity and hers was coming from a place of love, which is where she's going to get a lot more support from, fa- from fans. Yeah. Toxicity, love. We moved to ancient Greece, the natural transition. Um, we have our whole Greek party in the house. People are wearing togas. Um, and the best part of it is they show the clips of the party they had like that back in 2003 on Battle of the Sexes and or Battle of the Seasons. And it's just great to have like those little editing touches by production of like paying homage to the history of the show and then getting to see people just having fun. Because I think we always say this, the challenge house is better when people are having fun. So even CT's pro tip, it's okay to have fun in the challenge house. I'm like, okay, well, can we keep this going for seasons after 40? Like, I know this is a celebration of sorts, but, like, it sounds like there's going to be a 41. Can we still let them have fun there? Well, can we keep this going throughout the whole season itself, too, or at least, like, midway? Because I feel like we have this moment every season where it's, like, the challenge is fun again, and then, like, five weeks later, it's not fun anymore. Um, Obviously, the game will get more serious. But even, like, you know, Devin's wig funeral happened, like, midway through the game on Free Agents. Like, that, like... Stuff like that, if it continues into episode eight, nine, and then when the like, game gets more serious, that's okay for fun to go away. But I just want to see it be fun again next week and the week after. Agree. Yeah. I love I love seeing them socialize. It also reminded me why I used to be such a Kara hater. Because <laughs> when she comes to the toga party in her uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show costume, is that what it was? Uh, yes. I was like, no one needs a costume for a toga party, Kara. Get a sheet like everybody else. That reminded me why I used to be a hater because I was like, you. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> it's the desire to be so different when it's like you, you don't have to be. Just put on a sheet. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I was also completely shocked at the amount of vapes that I saw being passed around. Like a ton and like I know that on all or USA too, like bananas and Michelle joked about always like going downstairs to have to like hit their vapes together. I'm like bizarre that they let them have that, but I guess it's no different than them letting them bring cigarettes. But it just was weird to me. These grown adults with their vapes weird to me, but sorry to anyone that listens that's a vapor. But just whatever. Their body, their choice. Imagine someone is staying in the house because they bought the right vape, they bought the right flavor, and it's like, ah, I gotta, I gotta keep that person in the house. They, they let me share their vape with them. Right. Huh. The party was fun though because it had fun, mm-hmm. but it also had some gameplay. That like, what's better than a toga party, and what's worse sometimes in forced gameplay? When you put it together, it's just as funny to watch. Um, yeah. Mixed in with Jenny West's incoherent ramblings. Every time she talks, I'm like, I just can't believe her accent is is what it is because it just, I I just I I just have to take a step back and put the subtitles on for a second. I I do actually really like Jenny, but it just it always throws me off for a second. I have no reaction to Jenny. I am so indifferent about her existence, honestly. I like her. They really had no reaction either. She's like, I just want to say. I love that you are making this move and sending my word. And then here comes Laurel. She's always been like that. She always has been on these shows. And I'm like, she's done basically one season, the challenge where her ex dog walked a lot of it. And then on all stars four, what did she do? Like Laurel. Uh, uh, mm. Is Laurel done a, sh- a show with Avery? All stars four. Stars, just all stars four. Yeah. Just all stars four. Where Avery sat there. <laughs> Yeah, where Avery, like Laurel, did not even throw themselves into elimination, and then they faced off for that last star, and Laurel just won. Um, I wonder if Laurel would have the same reaction if Avery won that last star. I don't know. Mm. Um, we also get the flip, though. Sorry if I just cut you off. No, you're good. But to Bananas talking to Tony, and he's speaking so honestly, like genuinely, like, hey, man, I get this, but like, if this is from a place of ego, like, that is her friend. She's known him before this sh- before even being on the show. Like, I-, I think it might be too soon to burn these bridges. So then Tony being like, but he he was cheering for Leroy. We said this last week. His best friend. Like, Tony's dumb, guys. He's not bright. 
And I also, hearing Bananas say that to Tony when he and Tony were the benefactors of Zach doing that. Well, it's it's actually identical, right? Like the only reason, because when Zach did that in Final Reckoning, um, it was just because he wanted to tell Amanda no. Tony and Bananas would never, ever do that for him. Not a chance. It's literally just because they're uncomfortable with a, women, a woman taking charge of their team or having more power. And it's it's an identical scenario. I think there's a little bit more to Tony's underneath, which we'll get into more when they get to the elimination. But um, I I think Tony also... Like, Zach clearly doesn't like women. It's it's not something that he hides well at all. Uh, I think Tony, in his mind, was making, like, a TV moment and didn't realize it's going to come across really stupid. Yeah. Yeah. And Tony is someone who needs other people to get courage at times. Um, I've been working on my, like, top 10 greatest females to never win blog. I've been putting a lot of effort into it. And I was writing about Kayla. And one of the things I wrote about is that um, the move to vote in bananas on vendettas, uh, Tony was hopping on Kayla, who was like, no, I'm 100% down to do the deal, like move. And he only did it because like he would not have had the confidence if she wasn't so steadfast in doing it. Yet she doesn't really get credit for taking out bananas on vendettas like he does, because obviously they were aligned. But she was the one who was like, had the balls to make the move. And he hopped on the train. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's frustrating. Um, however, people in this house are getting out their frustration themselves uh, from partying to hooking up. And we're going to backtrack a little bit from before the Toka party. Um, we got Brad and Emily hooking up. And when Luke and I did our launch special recap, I kind of suggested the idea that um, it might be a potential one sided affair as like Brad was like, fantasizing about Emily in a way that she didn't really seem to be reciprocating this episode I mean they're cuddling they're fucking in the shower uh, and Emily's like yeah he has a beard and biceps he's really hot like what do you want me to do um, so good for them it did, well, it's, it did take me back like she she has always hook up queen but like under the radar um she is settling for him, though, because she did admit that she's in love with Casey, madly in love with Casey. And I've never been so territorial in my life. And I was like, no, uh, back up. That is not these woman. <laughs> that was weird. It was weird. Like, not even like a ha ha. Like, oh, it was like, oh, uh, we're apologizing to Nani. who's not here and saying strange things. Which, I mean, I guess when you look back to how their relationship started, it's kind of full circle in a way but they're it's fine. not it's not even like a like a girlfriend so they're engaged they're like yeah. fully engaged these days that's that's to me where it gets a little bit weird of like the engagement line is when it gets like hairy because yeah. obviously you know yeah. yeah um however back to brad and emily um i'm sure they're appreciating the shower because i they don't look like they have like great ones at home. So they're just really embracing it together. Um, and they're two incredibly good looking people. I don't think this is going to be like a showman's like relationship off the show, but on the show they're having fun. And I'm, you know, it's good to see, especially like two OGs hooking up like that. Brad yeah. will send Emily DMs for the rest of her life and she will ghost him. She would drink her moon water and contemplate <laughs> And just meditate the memories away. <laughs> oh. He also had some other showmances picking up. Um, Devin and Michelle, like, she was kind of pining for him on the launch special. They're hooking up. Thoughts on that? It makes so much sense. It's actually crazy. Yeah, I think that they make perfect sense. Yeah. Like, I if- think- no, I think Michelle's out of his league, um, but I'm going to say that about most people when it comes to Devin, um, which I think is going to lead him to treat her really well. So I think it'll work pretty well for a while. If Devin won't be with Rashida, I'll allow him to be with Michelle because that girl loved him. 
if you look at their IG stories, they are truly like obviously it's still IG, but like they they definitely seem like a perfect pair. Yeah. Um, Theo and Olivia is going on to hot and heavy. Like it's no more playful flirting. They're they're hooking up. Good for them. They're like a real life couple now too. Still. Mm-hmm. Still, still holding out. Still going strong. And now we have, I think, we're going to move on and call this uh, Naya sampling. Because at the beginning of the episode, we got her in the pool with Josh. And they're making out, they're cuddling, and seems like they're having a really good time together. Luke, what do you think? I think that John A. had a funny confessional about it that I can't exactly remember her wording, but I laughed and had to go back and rewatch. I think we didn't see them making out. I think that we saw Josh lean in and she turned her cheek and he kissed her cheek. I'm sure they didn't make out. The power of editing is going to make Josh the goof as they have before. Um, back to Zoe, the what party. do you think? <laughs> uh, I thought it was funny and harmless yeah. and like, whatever good for her um good for him even if they weren't making out in the pool when you have your they arms were, and legs were. wrapped around a person mm-hmm. you're just like sitting there floating and giggling and canoodling that is just as intimate as making out um so i these hookups don't face me anyway unless someone were married like or one of them was nicole zanata then i'd be like Ugh. uh but I think I actually love it for Josh because I think that everyone who watches this show and half the people on the show are very mean to him. So it's nice to see him get some attention. I think that he is a sweet, lovable goofball. Um, Maybe not so lovable all the time, but like deep down, yeah. Yeah, it's just shocking that it was Naya, I guess. I mean, Slim Pickens. Well, yeah, there's only so many single ladies on this cast true but like so fast forward so fast forward <laughs> to toga party um and you have naya who's basically actively working against kylan in like the politics of this game of pushing avery to vote in era four and then kylan is trying to talk politics but also flirt with her and then they you make have such it. a beautiful way of thinking about this game <laughs> let's she, make out she was trying to black widow him guys yeah and i like that nice talking like i'm having fun and i'm playing politics which i think like good for her because i think we've also complained about naya's spot on this cast because she doesn't really represent her era having two hookups going on at the same time having an actual like not a fake love triangle literally bouncing between two people manipulating them but also playing the game good for naya like good for her like she is like earning the spot on that cast that elimination last week we won't talk about it now because this is more important yeah. Team, team Zoe was really raking in the hookup points. This episode. <laughs> That's like a multiplier. You get the you get the, the, the two different people in one episode that multiplies. Yeah. Um, but she goes into bed with Kylan and they're they're going at it, like just straight up in the bed to where people in the house can clearly hear, clearly see them. Cause there's no real walls. And I'm sorry, the group that was outside laughing, okay, sure, Theo, Olivia, Michelle, Tori, Corey, whatever, and Tina, who episode one was like, I've got to be in bed at 9 p.m. because I can't stay up like these kids do. I'm like, she's right in the mix where she wants to be. It cracked me up. And also reacting in any way any normal person would who's like having, being forced to listen to people be intimate and also just knowing like, it's just, it. It's funny. You have to laugh. Otherwise, you'd be crying, probably. Um, I thought it was hilarious. Someone in the crowd of, like, listening to the Kylan and I thing, they start talking about Josh and this whole situation of, like, oh, he's right there. We see Josh rustling in his bed of, like, oh, I can't sleep because Kylan and I are clearly fucking nearby. Um, And someone says, Josh is a pimp. And then Tori kind of just, like, laughs off that idea and makes fun of it of, like, Kind of a way to shit on Josh. I mean, she just shit on Josh. Um, and to me, that's like the real Tory deal. Um, who I think like. I would be it, down for if that's who she 
showed it. Like I've, I have always maintained when she's messy and like when she gets mad, I'm like, you see that? I'm like, I could get behind this. It's when it's like the peace and positivity, which is important for sure. But like, that's not who you are at your core. I don't know. Very conflicted with her all the time. Well, I think there also could just be like a a fork in or who she wants to be and who she has been and is. I do think there is some element of wanting to be the better version of yourself and sometimes falling back into old habits. Um, and also that comes with like a lot of self-awareness and reflection and like honest feedback. So I think it's really hard when the vast majority of like even your interaction from fans is like over the top hateful so that you can't even really see maybe what is constructive criticism through that yeah and i think uh, through all this too like tori's facade or just who she wants to be perhaps because facade makes it seem like she's misleading it's not for me to say uh i think she just was like having some drinks and having some fun and like talking some shit like yeah. people like to do uh, it just was unfortunate that Josh, who she's had a real friendship with before, heard. And I don't think he – we're all going to say this. I don't think he was actually that upset that she joked off him being a pimp. I think he was feeling a little butt hurt and didn't want this to be on TV that, like, okay, a girl chose another guy over him. Uh, but what followed, I enjoyed. Yeah. And let's actually – let's jump into that. Like, Josh has a confessional where he says – Naya is a single woman. She can do whatever she wants. Like, would he prefer to be in like a in a bed with her rather than Kylan? Obviously, but I don't think Josh is upset, especially because like he's someone who's had multiple hookups on these shows and like bounced around. Like he's a single guy too. He's not gonna like he's gonna be respectful of that. So good on Josh for like actually being like open to admit that. Zoe, do you want to say something? Well, just how far have we come on this show to have the man that kind of gets made to look like an idiot or like the loser or whatever, the one that the leftover that's not chosen, that he, instead of, if this was 10 years ago, he'd, not he, but this man would be slut shaming her, making her out to be like the nastiest woman on television. And by doing that, like that, making that simple comment of like, she's a single woman, she can do what she wants protects her from so much online hate which i think is so important um it cannot be understated enough i think she'll still get it because the internet is a cesspool of terrible human beings but i really appreciate him and that's why i will defend josh over and over again because i do think his morals in terms of respecting women are so much stronger than so many men we've seen on this show so i really appreciated that from him completely Go back five years ago, and you have Nani sitting on that douchebag, uh, no, no, that douchebag Chase from The Bachelor getting mad that Nani was sitting in Banana's lap, when it's like, you've known her for 10 minutes, and you're upset that, like, she's sitting in the lap of her, like, friend of over a decade, and it's just, like, that is, like, the difference between this and that moment with Josh right now. Um, moving back into Tori, though, uh, Josh confronts her and says, you know what, like, I would take a bullet for you in this friendship, essentially, like, that's the way, that's how loyal josh has been to tori on these shows and he's like over the years you just do shit like this to me all the time i'm just done with the friendship and that was the build-up i to me because you go back to spies lies and allies when fessy got dq'd how did that happen tori got him out of bed when he was drunk and his best friend got dq'd and that hurt his game you go back to usa too only two people voted for josh in that elimination she was one of the two votes he goes into that elimination with Fessy, misses the final. And her confessionals are always like kind of like backhanded compliments to him. And he has to watch it over and over again. So in this moment, when he hears Tori like kind of like joking and laughing at him, he's just done with it. And I don't even think Josh was angry with her. He's just tired of her. And I did feel for him in this moment because he was truly minding his business. It's not like he was like out there making a scene and she said something like he was trying his best to not make it a moment. And he hears it being made a moment by someone he considers a friend. And as you said, one that's not really been the best friend to him. Yeah, it's just different. You expect that stuff from Theo, from Tina, from whoever who's sitting around. But not and they both live in Miami, right? Like they're spending significant time with each other outside of this show. So if anything, that relationship has gotten stronger, you would think. 
Um, it's funny when she first said that I just interpreted it as her, like mocking Theo and his accent and his choice of words. That was really how I like interpreted it. Cause I didn't even really know what she said. Um, but I do understand the other side too, of how it looks like she's like completely laughing off the idea that he could get a girl. Um, she's also yeah. just hee at his offense at his like expense because she, she isn't because yeah. that whole group was kind of laughing at his expense yeah and you know you kind of hope you have a friend being like defend you at least um yeah i or have to like just simply yeah. not participating i have to tee off on tori a bit here because when josh did confront her i got so mad because when he first looked like he's like hey you were laughing at my expense and she just kind of lied and said no uh, I wasn't part of that group. And Josh is like, no, I've heard you. I saw you. And once she has like, okay, he's not believing that. Let's bring out the tears. And once she brings out the tears and he doesn't immediately be like, oh, you know what? It's sorry. We're still friends. We'll talk tomorrow. Um, she then gets angry. And then when he doesn't back down to the anger, she goes back to the tears. And to me, it was just all so performative of like the way she's been able to manipulate and use Josh over the years. And like just people on this show and Josh just was tired of it. And he's like, I'm walking away from this right now. And she was just, I think, throwing out everything she could to make sure the friendship stayed intact. And they probably will be friends again because that's who these people are. But it pissed me the fuck off. What really bothered me the most is when he was calmly explaining how he felt. And she's like, I see what you're trying to do here. And I'm like, those type of words trigger me. Like if I'm like calmly explaining my feelings and someone says, I see what you're trying to do. As if I'm like trying to manipulate a situation. I'm like, what? And I thought that way for him. I do think she actually was mad and sad because I think she'd been drinking. Do I think they'll be best friends two weeks from then? Probably. Um, but I thought it was a good moment for for Josh to like stand his ground too because had he overreacted, then he would have become the bad guy that so often we have seen him as. Yeah, he would have so, been labeled as the crybaby and whatever. I uh, did yeah. Well, I didn't necessarily see it as performative. I saw it as a lack of skills relationally, honestly. I thought it was a lack of conversational and relational skills that she didn't, she couldn't, and again, alcohol plays a big role in these things, but I think she has a deficit in her communication skills, especially when it comes to her relationships. I think that it takes a significant amount of work to get to the place where your friend's can say, hey, you really hurt me and I'm really upset and like might even say something that cuts you like you're not actually my friend. And instead of jumping on the defensive and jumping down their throats, you have to like pause and be like, oh, shit, like it doesn't matter what I did or what I didn't do, but I hurt someone I care about. So the, my first step is to apologize, not to get defensive. But that is we're talking about reality TV stars, right? Like, yeah, <laughs> that's not what they're known for. I I agree with both of you in that, like, what Luke said of, like, him not being his explosive, exaggerative self, like, I think that's partially why I thought it was performative, because we didn't see that version of Josh who goes crazy, who gets loud, who, like, you know, was really upset. Like, he was just so tired, and, like, Tori was not used to this response from Josh either, I think. Um, and that's why it was, like, a unique scene to me, because, like, I'm not used to seeing this version of Josh at all on this show because he'll he'll turn i mean the smallest things into like mountains like he just this was this was a different josh and that's why it, it stuck out to me and i don't like i think that josh needs tori in his game to an extent but not as much as he has in other seasons like yeah. laurel's gonna ride for josh bananas is pretty close with josh like he, like Naya obviously is going to ride with him. Like just because she's hooking up with Khan doesn't mean she doesn't like him anymore. They're not on the same team. So yeah. They're going to be friends again next week because Josh is very forgiving. That's just who he is. And there's just no way you can't like Tori works her way back into being like friends with everyone. I mean, she shit on Anissa for years and now they're best friends. So it, they're going to be friends. Uh, back to the game, I guess now uh, we're in the arena. And people have to make their votes of who's going to go in. Uh, and I have this labeled as Avery redeems herself because we watched All Stars 4 and we were just really upset that Avery had these opportunities to throw herself into elimination to earn a star. 
and she never took the shot. She just never took it and then was out of the game after losing that daily challenge to Laurel. Um, I think Avery knew that was going to be a factor coming into this game. And so with a situation like this, she was like, yeah, I'll throw myself in. I'm not going to do whatever Tony wants, and I'm going to stand for in my ways because I'm not playing scared anymore. So kudos to Avery. Like, we didn't want that All-Stars War version, and you're not that so far. True. I guess I guess my thing is, because I agree with Zoe in that it is a dumb move. It is a big move. And I think her redemption comes with the ending of the episode. But uh, I guess the difference is on All Stars 4, like the goal was to get a star. Like there was actually yeah. incentive beyond like just keeping a friendship. Um, however, I do think in a season where I really thought there would be minimal chatter about Avery, like this helps bolster her game for sure. I mean, she was like, I've not made the thumbnail yet, but like she's probably going to be the center of the thumbnail. Like she had a great episode. Yeah, she made us look so dumb, guys. <laughs> it's it's true though, because like this is like, and now people are like, we're not angry about this either, because like some people no. even in our comments were like, why are you guys so mean about Avery? It's like we just there were people we thought should be on this cast instead. But if Avery is going to be here, we want her to do stuff, and she's doing stuff. Like she, prove us wrong, and we'll be happy. It All Stars Four was like the Tyra Banks. We are rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. Like that is how we felt about Avery. So we were so let down on all stars, all stars four. I do think she was done a disservice by not showing whatever the hell was going on between her and Adam. I think that really didn't help, but um, I do think it was a great TV moment for her. I think it was stupid, a stupid game move. It was very risky, but um if you're gonna if you're gonna shoot, you might as well shoot big, you know. Like, and I think, like we said before, both her game and personal reasons for doing this were much stronger than Tony's. Tony comes across looking like a big idiot, and I love the way that she called him out when they had to step down into the sand. Yes, and she looks stunning. She shows a great outfit to be doing it in. Like, she looked amazing. I'm glad they had the jersey on standby for her because if she had to compete in that, you know, like that outfit would have been tough. Um, let's talk about the reasonings actually a little bit because I do think like Derek the relationship between her and Derek if you go back in her Instagram during the 10 years these two were not on the show they were still like hanging out every weekend I think they were even roommates together at one point like these are two that's a, that's a real friendship and Derek is someone who on this show has gone into elimination after elimination with even friends voting him in for once he has a friend who actually would take a bullet for him and that's nice to see it's always the women. But, like, no, it is, like, it is so cool, especially, like you said, when someone has just been kind of the scapegoat, an easy boat, to for someone to stand up for them in that way. I do wish that he'd been like, hey, no, you don't have to do this for me. Um, but I think she ended up a bigger winner because she did. Um, so everything happens for a reason, I guess. Uh, but... I think it was important that she noted that she thought Tony was trying to get an early exit. That yes. he's there to collect a paycheck and he wanted out. Yeah, because we want I want to examine this from two angles. That exact angle of Tony wants to just leave the show, which if that is true, everything else in this episode makes a whole lot more sense. But from the angle of like him just being an idiot, I gotta I wanna attack this from this point of yeah. he's making a deal with Era 4. Uh, let's talk about Casey. Is Casey going to have his back or is he going to have Jordan's back first? Literally everyone. Everyone's but his. Corey. Yeah. Like literally Corey is the only one where it's a 50-50 and even then it's, it's still a 50-50. So even if Tony makes this deal with Era 4, he's still the fourth guy for them because all those people have done so many seasons with the Era 4 people. And even so... Like, they were still under the assumption that people would be picking captains each week. Casey was just captain. What makes you think she's going to be captain anytime again soon? Like, it just... It, didn't, if you make... Make it didn't make sense on every level. Like, yeah. you're trying to weaken their team. You're trying to weaken either Era 1 or Era 4. The, the obvious move is to put in Era 4 because you're going to lose two strong competitors. 
And also, if you're Tony and you're gung ho about like, hey, Avery, I'm on your side. We're going to go with whatever you want. You know what happens if you save Derek and Aviv? You get John A more on your side. You get Naya more on your side. You get Ryan more on your side. Uh, you get, I mean, you probably get most of Era 2 more on your side because you're saving their team. So it's not just a like Era 4 or nothing type situation. There are people both within your team and the other, other team that's up that you could potentially make you know, bridges with. It's idiotic what he did. I, d I don't think that his rationale was stronger than Avery's at the end of the day. Um, I think that the, I think honestly what would have saved him more going forward is that he proved himself to be pretty cancerous on his team and other teams would have just not voted him in on that principle alone. Mm -hmm. Nope. And so we're going to Darrell and Tony versus Jody and uh, Jody and Avery in elimination. And the elimination they're playing is there's a bunch of heavy colored tiles. Um, they have to run back and forth and make a bridge with these tiles. There's very specific rules amongst these colored tiles. Um, like green can't touch yellow. Um, Yellow can't touch blue. Blue can only be touching a like, certain very specific rules. And Darrell even says before the elimination, uh, this elimination is coming down to the crowd of like, who's going to instruct us on where to put what at this point, because um, that's how these eliminations just play out now. So in, in a way, it came down to a battle of listening and cardio rather than actual puzzle solving. Yeah. This would have been a really interesting elimination to be done in isolation without a team to help you um, because yeah, it really just comes down to who's in better shape and stronger, faster, more putting more effort in perhaps. Um, yeah. The, this was, if you want to talk about crowd participation, this was the most crowd participation. They were just following directions. Yeah. It's very frustrating. I mean, like I think we're all over the crowd participation eliminations at this point. Like they're just, it's okay when it can be like have a small effect on the game, but when it completely becomes like who has the better crowd influence, like that's when it becomes, I don't know, I tune out a little bit. Yeah. I agree with you. I think I would also be a total hypocrite if it was my favorite in elimination and I'd be wanting all the crowd participation. I know myself well enough to know that that's how I would feel. But I think from a purely game standpoint that they should be mitigating that somehow. Yeah, I don't mind when it's like little tips of like, hey, hold on to the rope a little bit closer or something like that. Um, but when it's literally like green, yellow, blue, green, yellow, blue, um, that's annoying. Uh, Darrell versus Tony. And if you thought that Tony was trying to get himself eliminated before this elimination, uh, it very much looked like it during it as he was clueless on what to put where. He had to keep rearranging his tiles. He seemed gassed out. and. Um, and I could believe he's a dumbass. I like yeah. that. That's something I could whatever. But he had Jordan and Devin, who said, although he is bad, numbers are good for us. He just looked like an idiot. I mean, like next time, don't make these so heavy. He's like the second biggest guy on the cast, right? And the worst part about this elimination is that Darrell didn't look good either because he tweaked his back, and he's in pain. He's literally like. Oh man, I don't even know if I'm gonna be able to get through this at that point. I just gotta push through. That's gonna affect him for weeks to come. So Darrell now has a bad back, so he probably he probably isn't winning this season. I'm just gonna say that right here, right now, because of how stacked this male cast is. And if your back isn't good, you're probably not outrunning them in a final. Not outrunning Jordan. No. <laughs> and it it is a huge disservice to Tony's game he's playing if he is actually trying to quit because when you have people in the stands yelling he is trying to throw this and your response is not no i'm not and to pick it up it's like okay like then why did you eliminate leroy last week i was wondering but we did accuse the leroy of the same thing last week so True. maybe leroy is just a better actor i mean tony didn't even look upset when it was all over he was like because I've seen, we've all seen Tony mad on this show. We've seen him pissed and disappointed. So the fact that when all was said and done and 
Darrell hobbled his way to victory, Tony didn't look bothered. If you can remember on All Stars 4 when Tony got that family emergency to go home, not that it's any of our business as viewers to know what that is, but like nothing ever came from that that we knew of. Like he shows up, collects his check. His wife says, all right, has it been enough time? Okay, there's a family emergency. Like, you know what I mean? Maybe don't come back if you're not going to stay beyond a week and a half. If production calls him again soon, that would actually be a slap in the face to us as fans and other cast members. Yeah. It's so annoying. It's just so annoying that like we lost some good nah. We lost so many good players and names, and it makes me wish, like, I wish I would, Hunter was here. Yeah. There's so many people I would take back in a heartbeat. I'd take Hunter would have said, throw in Kylan and Casey right now. Yeah. Hunter, Marlon, Dustin, Frank. Uh, so many names that you could have just thrown on this cast. I mean, instead, you had Leroy and Tony battling to see who can get eliminated first. Um, it's... It's super frustrating, and it's like, well, <laughs> Corey tried to have a rivalry with a guy who didn't even want to be there. Yeah. Moving on to the women. Moving on to the women, and it seemed like Jody and Avery's uh, puzzle elimination was actually tougher, and that there were you had to have a much more specific order of colors, and I think there were a little bit more rules, which that made sense to me because I was watching the first elimination, thinking to myself, well, if they just do the same thing. Isn't that just kind of easier? You know, isn't that, you know, because they already know what to do from the first people going. Um, so they changed it up. I think they made it a little bit harder. Uh, and again, this came down to the crowd. Uh, Avery was just had better, better cardio. I mean, I think she was better listener. I think she, I think she's in better. Sh I will know. Okay. So this is actually what I think. I think they're both in great shape, but I do think you have two women who are in pretty much equally good shape and one is older. That and one's yeah. One's pissed off. Like, yeah. One's yeah. pissed off. You have both of those things that are major factors. I think Jody did it's pretty much an equal job. She was just a few steps behind because at one point they both had to completely start over. Yeah. Um, Avery was just in a little bit better shape and was more fired up. And like, big ups to Avery because Jody is one of the most fit women in challenge history. So to beat her in a cardio event, like, even though she is a bit older, like, as you said, like, she's still in better shape than 90% of challenge women ever. So, like, good yeah. for you, Avery. I think she would have beaten most of Avery's team, maybe except other than Tori. I think she would beat John A. and Naya in that elimination. Yeah, and I would say, like, Jody's build is probably better for uh, being able to lift because they're, I mean, there's some people on that cast who probably can run better than Jody, but probably can't run and lift. So, Avery doing that with, like, her frame super impressive yeah i did feel for jody afterwards because she was upset and i think it's like the realization that like this might have been my last go on this show that that hurt me too <laughs> i felt for her and i do think that like she is what someone who genuinely loves this game and i mm -hmm. think she was ready to give it her all and she stepped up for her team and it bit her in the ass um which again i go back to don't be nice. Put Anissa in every time, like every single time. Do it until she's gone because you can't afford to lose the Jodies when you have Anissa on your team. If this had been Anissa in her place, like Era One looks great. Like, like they are taking it. Nice. Darrell's back could have been broken in half. They still look great. If this was uh, Anissa in this elimination, they could have said you only have to do half the tiles, and Avery still would have won. Like that's really what it would have come, what it, what it would have come down to. Um, though I will say, testament to the strength of this cast, we lost. I think Jody, who's I think she's a top ten all time competitor on the women's side, and she's just physically beaten by someone like Avery, who not is not like a big threat, but isn't a slouch by any means. Like this women's cast is like strong as hell. And we can just casually lose Jody, like right here, first traditional episode of the season. Right out the gates. Yeah, I wish for Jody's sake things had gone down a little differently. Um, maybe we'll see her on an all star season again. But 
Uh, I'm so pumped for Avery and I'm glad they, I, I halfway wonder if production planned on them participating separately or if they just did it to throw a wrench in things because it definitely made for a better TV moment and she comes off the hero of the episode. Oh, for sure. I could not believe they literally had her on, on the shoulders, though, of like, <laughs> I was just like, this is like the first traditional elimination of the season. And we got people on shoulders like they won the championship. Um, but it was a good moment. But still, I thought I thought that was a little over the top. I think that. Yeah, it was cute. And I think that people saw like it actually took a very mental toll on her. Yeah. Like we said, it's an all star sport. You can see every emotion on her face. Same here. Like. This really bothered her. So, you know, was it a lot? Sure. Were they really trying to make her feel like she came out on top? Definitely. I do think, I I was just going to say from a female perspective, like you do often get this like feeling like you're being made to feel like you're crazy when you know you're right about something. And like Tony through his misogyny, just making her feel like, like she was put in this awful position where she risked her entire game for her friend just because there was a man that was too stubborn to let her have her way. Like that is, I don't think you can possibly understand how that weighs on a woman unless you are a woman. Cause that just sucks. Like you just feel so powerless. And I think there's probably been many examples in any person's life where you feel like totally justified in everything you're doing and to have it like to have to go through the harder way just because someone else was being an asshole. Like that sucks. So she, I'm glad she won. Yeah. Are you glad about the next twist? I liked it from a TV standpoint a lot. I agree. I felt bad for her, but I liked the TV plot point. (laughs) So the twist is uh, Darrell and Avery as the elimination winners get the power of they have to nominate four people of the opposite sex, uh, one from each era, as the team captain for the next challenge, meaning they'll be eligible to, you know, either get individual safety or directly into elimination or be the two people up for elimination. So in a way, you're kind of putting, you're nominating four people for elimination next week. Uh, it is a hybrid of like the grenade from Vendettas and the relic from World of Bulls 1 because you do get safety for a whole week. But that safety is going to come back right at you as those four people are going to have ammunition to nominate you again. Um, I don't know how I feel about this because I think it's like it allows certain people to coast for a whole week. Like we have, we know, we know over 20 people are not going to be going into elimination, but we do know who is going into elimination. And it kind of, it's an interesting twist. Well, it's like whoever does win the elimination next week, are they're going to nominate Avery and, and, Darrell, Darrell, right? Like, maybe not, but, like, it just seems like that's the easiest scapegoat. Yes. I, I mean, that that is the easiest move, which, if you don't do it, it'll even be a more interesting wrinkle of, like, you have even more drama going on. So that's... There's going to be good drama. People are forced to take shots at one another, and it's stirring the pot. I think the only thing that potentially protects the person who wins the elimination is that these teams are being forced into these positions to either protect one of their own or to take a shot at another team. So if my team is looking at Avery, not as the biggest threat from the female side that she could be protected. Um, I, I think it's a sticky situation to be in, but I do think you can maneuver out of it. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about Avery's nominations first. Uh, she picks Derek because he's the only person not looking at her, which I loved. I, I also think it was, I did all stars with Brad and CT is CT. So. Yeah. Uh, she goes to era two and uh, Ryan and Derek are her boys. So she picks bananas and congrats to Nehemiah. Cause I think, I don't think anyone is benefiting more from this format than Nehemiah because he's just the perfect under the radar player if he doesn't make any enemies. So it's yeah. either going to be like Bananas or Ryan every week, I think. Yeah. Flying right under the radar. It's perfect. <laughs> him. But like shots fired by Avery again. Good for her. Uh, she was also, she's also always been like anti bananas because he was always very team Johnny Riley back in the day of like the whole situation where they were it was bananas leroy riley were really shitting on her on an x's two after show um so good for her for getting that 
that look back. Um, era three, Jordan just steps up for the team. Um, total Jordan move. I hate when I like him. I know. I just was going to say, he makes it really hard not to like him. He really, like, he, he just, and this is what I liked about him as far back on free agents, right? Like, he will always back up the shit that he talks. He yeah. is so, he is so, feels like he is the best competitor on this show, and he's not scared of anyone. Like, he just watched Derek and Bananas get called into elimination, and he's like, I'll do it. Do you guys want an embarrassing story from me? Yeah, always. Okay, so I've interviewed Jordan twice, including one time face-to-face in a camera like this. A couple years ago, I think it was the Challenge All-Stars 3 after party, I saw him, I was like, hey, man, you remember me? And he just looks at me, he says, no, and walks away. And then I, we ended up encountering each other later. And I was like, I was like, oh, I interviewed you. We talked about stuff. And we, he was really nice for that like time. And um, fast forward uh, a few weeks ago, there's the party um, in L.A. for Challenge 40. I see I'm at the Valley checkout. Jordan's standing behind me. I look at him, and I'm like, you, do you know who I am? And then he goes, no. And I'm like, still don't. And then he's like, and I tell him about the whole thing the last time. And he's like, how am I supposed to win this game? And then we end up talking for 10 minutes, um, waiting for our cars. But that is literally who he is. And I'm like, he's our girlfriend. I told him, like, there's something about him where you think he'll remember you because during the interview, he says your name 20 times. He'll look you in the eyes. He'll make you feel so good about yourself. And then he just goes and lives in his own world. And I actually love that more than any other cast member because he just, he does this show, he locks in, he does his interviews, he locks in, but then he just goes and races cars and does whatever. And talks shit about Ashley Mitchell on live. Oh, that was weird with those big ass glasses on. I knew when he put on those big ass glasses, he was going to say something dumb. I do think he's one of the only cast members that doesn't Google his own name. I agree. Well, so like in 2017, his PR company, when he was doing like a fashion thing, was trying to fly me out for like, uh, hey, do you want to cover this like fashion runway thing? And I was like a chubby 20 year old in my like basement and being like, I don't think I'm a good fit for this. (laughs) (laughs) Um, uh, So Jordan steps up for the team. Uh, The fourth nominee ends up being Horacio. Um, which to lose one of those four guys next week for certain is crazy. And I think this, if anything, this was a compliment to Horacio. That was Avery saying you're the best guy on your team. I think she did say that actually, but yeah, I was, I was shook. Part of me wonders too, if it just wasn't shown, but Horacio had been like, I'm kind of checked out. Yeah. Oh he, yeah. He probably is also like talk with her the least. Cause he just, is not the most social guy, so it's easy to vote him in. Um, yeah. Horacio versus Bananas, Horacio versus Jordan, Horacio versus Derek, Bananas versus Jordan, Bananas versus Derek, Derek versus Jordan. All of these potential eliminations are would be all timers. Um, yeah. So they're going to play tic-tac-toe or something, or they're going to make them throw ninja throwing stars. Yeah. I, I just really hope, I mean, I have no idea what happens. We all know I'm spoiler free, but like, can we not give Jordan a an elimination where he's at a significant advantage, like literally having to hold on to something. Can we make sure we don't do that? Yeah. Oh man. It's going to be a great battle next week. Uh, Let's move into the women's nominations because somehow those ended up being messier ish. Um, Darrell nominated Anissa and Anissa took great offense to it. What do you expect? It's Tina's turn, Luke. She is an elite competitor. She's going to win this season. Um, she could have won all of them if she tried. She just didn't want to. It's actually insane. It's making my blood boil that Darrell would think to do something so uh, completely unfair to Anissa, of all people, who puts her heart and soul into training for the show. A spotless reputation, a, a, a devoted, just like athlete, a pillar of this show, might I add. If this is the first time listening to us, <laughs> and you were lying, you know, this is the utmost sarcasm. Uh, 
Shout out to Tina, though. I, I do want to say there was a little <laughs> clip of, like, Rachel and Tina working out, and I was just like, Tina's looking good. Like, I, I see why Darrell's, like, not voting her in, because, like, she's she legit is in the best shape, like, she's been in in a long time. So, like, makes it a lot easier to vote in Anissa. All of Anissa's connections are not on Era 1. Like, no. that's what's going to happen. No, people from Era 1 know what she's capable of. That's why they're voting her in. Um, Era 2... Darrell looks at that stacked lineup. He's Carlos's girl, Aviv's his former partner. Comes down to Emily and Laurel, basically, and he says, I'm voting for Laurel. Which I could not believe. Uh, I think, one, she's potentially best player on the team, so you're looking at getting rid of the best player on the team. And really good chance at getting rid of Anissa and anything. That's true. That's how he could spin that. You're so right, Zoe. He then nominates Naya, uh, and Naya has a confessional like, oh my god, I don't want to face either Laurel or Anissa. They're both such beasts. Did you catch the smirk on Tori's face? It was really interesting to me, because that was the moment where she was like, I felt like, I, maybe I'm misinterpreting it, but very confident she's going to coast through this portion of the game because she feels like she has friends everywhere. I agree. Yep. And then who was the Era 4 nomination? Jenny West. Jenny West. And Darrell said it was because I literally just don't know you. Um, Even though she's like very impressive physique. So I will say Jenny versus Laurel elimination. That does sound fun. I would actually say Naya versus Jenny is a fun elimination just because like it would just be like the size difference of like, oh, tall versus super muscular would be like kind of fun to watch, even though we were underwhelmed from Jenny, I mean, from Naya a week ago. Um, they're interesting nominations. I'd say two strong players, two not so strong players. More interesting though is the promo for next week, uh, in which the way it's edited, it makes it seem like Laurel, who might be peed by Darrell nominating her. Um, makes a comment that maybe like you shouldn't be getting massages while you're married or giving massages while you're married. I couldn't figure out what either of the two, but and Darrell seemed really pissed off. Well, and we did just watch the man like legitimately tweak his back. <laughs> so like I Darrell has never these casts are full of beautiful women. I have never gotten the vibe in the slightest that any of them have caught his eye. He seems very devoted to his wife. So that is a crazy low blow. Like the man's literally injured. Yeah. I'm still kind of shook from it, honestly. I, I think that Laurel is kind of undermining her legacy while still being an elite competitor, which is kind of crazy because like the tides have definitely turned on her. She's, I mean, not completely, but like, I want to like her cause I used to like her so much. And then like, she says things like that. And I get being upset about thrown, being thrown in and next week we might sing a different tune and have different context. I doubt it. But like, that just seems like a low blow that has ramifications beyond the game. Yeah, that's too much. And I've been a Laurel defender. I was a Laurel defender when she went for Big Easy. I was a Laurel defender when she went for Paula. Like, I really, those comments didn't bother me at all in the context of reality TV at the time. Maybe now that I'm more grown up, I'd have a different reaction. But I remember at the time being like, hell yeah, get them. And I think it's crazy. Like, her and Darrell also have a history going way back. So I... To me, as someone that's on the cast with her, if I'm one of her castmates or one of her friends, call colleagues, call what you want, that would make me so nervous to have interactions with her because she just showed that she could she'll take shots at literally the most universally liked challenger maybe ever. Mm -hmm. That's what's so perturbing to me. It's that like you're coming at someone like that with like literally like basically no baggage. Because, like, as you said, like, Big Easy, anyone who's actually interacted with Big Easy, like, I would say 30% of those people will know, dude's a dickhead. He's just a, a flat-out dick. Like, I've met him, not, like, I didn't have, like, if you had a good interaction with him, 
good. I met him, he was a dick, but also I know 10 other people who met him and think he's just as big of a dick. Like, it's like, that's who he is. Darrell, not the case. And it's you're going after these people with, like, no baggage just because you're, like, on tilt, just completely on tilt over everything. That is, that, it's just, I don't know. You seek help or something because, like, that's not the person to mess with. Like, if you want to mess with Bananas or CT or even, like, someone like like Brad, they have baggage. But Darrell, what the fuck is going on here? I just think she's a narcissist, guys. I think that, like, I'm not a psychologist, so... Take it with a grain of salt, but I think that would be some serious heavy lifting for a psychologist to do some work with her because there are things that are off. Normal people don't act that way. Normal people don't say things like that and do things like that. Like, And this seems like a contradiction for who we are and what we stand for is drama on reality TV. However, I think Alan hits the nail on the head. If it's someone that's so universally loved, it hits us so much different. As she knows, as someone who's been on these shows for so long, like she's not making this comment from Kim or to Kim from Germany, who we can all be like, oh, and he fades into oblivion. Like, what if she had just come for her grimy ex in this way? Like, think about how much universal she s- support she had after X on the Peak and how people defend her or defended her. Like, go for the dirt bags but we see you like being chummy chummy with like johnny bananas and going for Darrell. we're excited for next week folks we're yeah. we're, we're, we're 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 hooked into this season because like we saw this trailer and we're like we want we want next week's episode right back so we can talk about it here with all of you at home um if you want to keep listening to us, make sure to subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple, uh, follow Twitter at CF Confessionals. Like, we really appreciate you all, especially if you're still listening at this point. Yeah. God, yeah. We never shut up. This is what happens when the show is good. We just don't stop talking about it. It's true. You know? We're talking about the potentials of next week. Before we're like, this episode's done. Congrats, Avery. Congrats <laughs> to uh, Darrell and your tweak back um seems like you're gonna have more back pain next week um overall though thanks everyone for listening have a great weekend